When the topic of best Smash game comes up, some will point to the latest game in the series, Ultimate. Some will point to the beloved classic on GameCube, Melee. And some might even point to the roots of the franchise, where it all started, Smash 64. In fact, if I were to create a tier list of Smash games, most would agree that it would look something like this. But aren't we missing a game? Ouch, that's rough. How did it even come to this? It seems the hate towards Brawl started only a couple years after the game released. Since Brawl was very different from its predecessor Melee, the competitive Smash community was split down the middle. Melee diehards took to forums and other online communities to express their hatred towards the latest game in the series. The notion that Brawl sucks carried into the Smash fanbase as a whole, and now it doesn't matter which type of Smash fan you ask, they'll most likely say the same thing about Brawl. This is extremely disappointing, because the bad reputation that Brawl has built up is due to a simple misconception. Brawl is the worst competitive Smash game, not the worst Smash game. In this video, I'm going to tell you why Brawl is actually still the best Smash game, competitiveness aside. And to cover my bases here, when I say Brawl is the worst competitive Smash game, I don't mean it's an awful competitive game that should never be run at tournaments. I've entered several Brawl tournaments and they're honestly pretty fun under the right rule sets. Brawl still has some really sick tech exclusive to the game, and other than the extremely floaty physics, Brawl is actually the most similar to Melee in a lot of aspects. There's ledge hogging, chain grabs, there's no rage, and both Falco and Marth still had a lot of their Melee DNA before Smash 4 took that away. Despite those positives, Brawl has an abundance of negatives including tripping, the floatiest smash engine with lots of landing lag on most moves, ledge stalling, Meta Knight, ledge stalling plus Meta Knight, and the game overall rewards degenerate play. So if you clicked on this video thinking I'd talk about how Brawl is actually the best competitive smash game, I'm sorry, you might have been clickbaited. Now with that out of the way, let's get into the good stuff. What makes Brawl still the best Smash game? I clearly remember the day my parents took me to Walmart to buy a Wii when I was 12. In addition to the console itself, my parents told me I could pick out one game I wanted. There were four games I was deciding between. Mario Galaxy, Twilight Princess, Mario Kart, and Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Although I knew I eventually would get all four of these games, the 12-year-old me at the time made a pretty wise decision. I decided to go with the game I thought would have the most amount of content. A game I could play hours on end, single player or multiplayer, even without any other games in my Wii library. That game was of course Super Smash Bros Brawl. Seeing as how I had poured hundreds of hours into both Smash 64 and Melee, I knew that Brawl wouldn't disappoint. What I didn't expect, however, was just the sheer amount of new content Brawl brought to the table. What we now know as series staples were first introduced in Brawl. The Challenges board provided a great addition for completionists. Online multiplayer, which hasn't really improved much in the games that followed, was a nice distraction from fighting CPUs when you didn't have any friends around. And Stage Builder came out swinging with the most robust variety of stage parts still to this day. And almost everything that Melee brought to the table was expanded upon in Brawl. More characters and stages go without saying, but I think the implementation of trophies peaked in Brawl. Trophies first started with Melee. These collectible items added a tremendous amount of replay value to the game. Each trophy contained a detailed summary of the character or object it was based on, as well as the game of origin. The fact that you're supposed to collect these things was driven home with a mode that showed you all the trophies you've obtained set up on a table. Trophies are mostly scattered throughout the various single-player modes in the game, but by using coins also earned from those modes, you could play a kind of vending machine minigame called The Lottery to more easily fill out your trophy collection. Melee had a total of 290 trophies, which is a pretty generous number considering it was a newly added feature. Brawl destroyed that number, with an overall trophy count of 544. The detailed trophy summaries were of course still intact, and the lottery from Melee was swapped out with a more in-depth coin launcher type game. 
I can definitely see this change being divisive because the lottery was more of a no BS type of way to get your trophies. But personally, I prefer the more gameplay focused coin launcher minigame in Brawl. Other than that, Brawl also introduced new ways trophies can be obtained. For starters, certain trophies are locked behind the newly introduced challenges board with a description of how to unlock them. This in and of itself provides more replay value and an actual incentive to complete the challenges board. And some other trophies can only be obtained by throwing the trophy stand item at enemies in the subspace emissary. Don't worry, I'll talk about the subspace emissary in depth soon enough. I always found this to be a little disturbing, the fact that you're basically collecting the frozen bodies of your enemies, forever stuck as a trophy. Wait, does that mean all trophies in the game are just frozen characters? Now that I think about it, characters in Smash have always been portrayed as some sort of trophy object. In Smash 64, the data section provided a very similar layout to how trophies would be viewed in later games. And in Melee, the trophy aspect could be seen right in the opening cinematic. I'm not going to try and be game theory here, and I am getting off topic, but the reason I'm talking about trophies so much is that Ultimate cut them all together in favor of spirits. I don't know anyone that prefers spirits over trophies. Yeah, they add some gameplay elements to the mix, but as a pure collectible, spirits are objectively worse. Spirits have no flavor text, there's no way to interact with them since they're literally just 2D images, and there's no mode comparable to the collection from previous games because how would you display a bunch of 2D images all in one place without scrolling up and down constantly? The removal of trophies in Ultimate could probably be seen coming because of the way they were handled in Ultimate's predecessor, Smash 4. The fourth installment in the series featured more characters, more stages, and naturally more trophies, but the implementation of trophies didn't feel the same. For starters, there was no longer a unique trophy minigame, instead replaced by Donkey Kong's Down B Adventure and a basic trophy shop that only restocks after you put enough hours into other areas of the game. But that change is minor compared to the larger problem at hand. Smash 4 marks the end of the Characters Are Trophies storyline that started the franchise, and that's because Smash 4 lacks an adventure mode. The subspace emissary from Brawl really was crucial in tying everything together. The whole plot of the subspace emissary is that everyone is being turned into trophies, in addition to the world ending or whatever. Now I'm not particularly crazy about this plotline, nor do I even remember the name of the final boss, but the way subspace connects with the rest of Brawl is something that we've never seen before in a Smash game, and probably never will. To this day, Brawl still features the best way of unlocking new characters in my opinion, through subspace. When your team saves a character from their trophy coffin in the story, that character is then unlocked to play in all the other modes of the game. It's simple but brilliant. It finally gives an actual reason why characters are unlocked rather than challenger approaching randomly. Well, now that I've started talking about Subspace Emissary, it's probably no secret that I think Subspace is the best part of Brawl. I basically made this whole video just so I could gush about it. Everything before this has been fluff. Subspace Emissary is the second and also last true adventure mode in a Smash game. Melee first introduced us to this type of gameplay with its obviously titled Adventure Mode. It has the player travel through different platforming levels with other types of challenges thrown into the mix. The worlds are based on Nintendo franchises, like starting off in the Mushroom Kingdom with a bunch of Goombas and Koopa Troopas, or running along the Big Blue track from F-Zero, avoiding racers along the way, and even escaping planet Zebus before it explodes like in Metroid. Again, just like trophies in Melee, this adventure mode was pretty good considering it was a newly added feature. The main downsides are that it's rather short for something called an adventure mode, and there's not much in terms of cutscenes that connect each level together. Everything feels kind of random. These two main downsides of Melee's adventure mode are what Brawl improves upon the most in the subspace emissary. Now, before I go any further, it's important to mention that not everyone likes subspace. The main criticism seems to be that the gameplay is dry and very repetitive. This is a point I can't disagree with. Whereas Melee's Adventure Mode offered a good mix of areas and gameplay objectives, all with themes based on Nintendo franchises, 
Brawl decides to go with a single, interconnected world containing generic-looking level themes and extremely repetitive maze-like designs. Instead of jumping on Goombas from Mario in addition to avoiding the Redead and Like Like from Zelda, Subspace has you mostly fighting against original characters specific to the game's story. How many times do we have to fight this thing before I want to pull my hair out? While some Subspace original characters have interesting designs, it's just much more enjoyable fighting against opponents from Nintendo franchises because you can go, Oh, I know this guy, or I hated these enemies in Ocarina of Time. It's a familiar feeling, and it represents the celebration of Nintendo worlds and characters. Now with that said, I can at the very least understand why Sakurai and the team decided to go the more generic route for Subspace's locales. Part of my complaints about Melee's adventure mode was how the stages didn't feel connected. You'd finish fighting Fox on Corneria, and then suddenly you're at Pokemon Stadium? It's hard making an adventure mode that feels cohesive when the worlds from Nintendo franchises are so different from one another. So rather than attempt to make something like that work, it's easier creating a single generic world where characters are found in places that resemble their own worlds. Pit from the clouds, Donkey Kong from the jungle, Marth at the top of an abandoned castle, Fox just straight out of the sky, snakes on a plane, so on and so forth. Structurally, it's not perfect, but it manages to make enough sense for a comprehensive storyline. And a comprehensive storyline is really all the subspace emissary needed, because the best part of subspace isn't the plot, nor is it the gameplay. The best part of subspace, and by extension the best part of Brawl or any Smash game, is the character interactions. The whole point of Super Smash Bros, or any crossover for that matter, is to see what would happen when your favorite characters from different franchises meet each other. How would they interact with each other? Would they get along? Would they be enemies? It's the stuff of fan fictions. Mario teaming up with Link. Ganondorf scheming with Bowser. Fox and Diddy Kong fighting Rayquaza? Now that goes beyond my wildest dreams. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, Subspace Emissary may have you fighting mostly generic enemies, but the bosses, on the other hand, are anything but generic. Rayquaza, Ridley, even Porky from Earthbound. It's all fan service when it comes to the bosses in subspace. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate actually also features these types of fan favorite bosses with the likes of Dracula, Ganon, Rathalos, and Marx in the game's quote-unquote adventure mode titled World of Light. But the problem is there's no cutscenes that are otherwise needed to add context to these boss fights. They just appear randomly in battle with a short intro. Let's compare that to the first Ridley boss battle in the Subspace Emissary. After Zero Suit Samus rescues Pikachu and retrieves her various suit from the research facility, just as they're about to escape, Ridley swoops down and takes Samus for a ride, only for Pikachu to return the favor of Samus saving him by letting out a thunder attack, which sets the stage for the battle. I remember first watching this back in the day and thinking this was the coolest thing ever, and watching it again now brings chills down my spine. It also makes me wonder what type of missed potential there's been over the years with the recent Smash games. One of the main reasons why Subspace can have so many of these amazing cinematics is because the progression is linear and locked to specific characters in specific areas. Whereas Melee's adventure mode can be played using any character, that's just not possible with something like the Subspace Emissary because there's no way they could have created 39 different versions of each story cinematic depending on which character you picked. On one hand, this could be considered another knock against the gameplay of Subspace, but I'd actually argue that this is beneficial to the gameplay of Brawl as a whole. I don't know about all of you, but whenever I play a Smash game, I typically just pick the same 2-5 characters I know I like because they're fast or they're from my favorite franchises. Since the Subspace Emissary forces you to use characters you aren't familiar with or would otherwise not have been interested in, it gives you gameplay you normally wouldn't have been exposed to, and who knows, maybe you'd even come to like the new characters. I remember one of the first times I got together with my friends back in the day to play Brawl, almost everyone knew how to use Pit. Some matches were even exclusively Pit. This is a character none of us cared about or even knew about before we played Subspace. I didn't even know Nintendo had a franchise called Kid Icarus. Not only does Subspace force us to use Pit right at the start of the game, it shows us what Pit is all about. He's in some sort of temple in the heavens and a goddess gives him his weapon, sending him off to help Mario and the gang. 
We don't need to know every small detail, but this cinematic alone is enough to introduce us to the world of Kid Icarus. Unfortunately, this is something Ultimate severely lacks. Despite having over twice as many characters as Brawl, a lot of players don't care or even know who half the roster is. Ultimate is supposed to be a celebration of gaming franchises, but it sure does a bad job of introducing them to us. I'd say the best part of any new character in Smash 4 or Ultimate is actually their reveal trailer, which obviously not every person that buys the game would have seen. Unless the character gets a lot of attention for being top tier, like Bayonetta or Joker, the overall spotlight for that character diminishes only a couple weeks after they release. For example, even though Banjo and Kazooie was one of the most requested characters, nobody really talks about them anymore. It certainly doesn't help that they're an average fighter at best. You can't deny that the most hype part about Banjo and Kazooie being in Smash is that initial reveal trailer where the Donkey Kong Country gang roots for their rare wear pals finally joining the fight. I imagine an alternate reality where Sakurai and the team created a subspace emissary part 2, so to speak, and it started us off by playing as Banjo and Kazooie in Spiral Mountain, or I guess some generic place that resembles Spiral Mountain. But due to the lack of any proper introduction, there's going to be so many kids that pick up Smash Ultimate and don't bother trying out Banjo and Kazooie because, who's that? I want to play as Mario and Pikachu. And this problem is even more apparent due to Ultimate's lack of trophies with proper descriptions. Now that I think about it, Ultimate also cuts out the Masterpieces section from previous Smash games. Originating in Brawl, the Masterpieces section allows you to demo a select number of games from franchises that make appearances in the main game. These demos could be unlocked via the Challenges board, with a total of 12 demos to choose from. While Smash 4 almost doubles that number to 23 demos, it mainly features NES and SNES games, whereas Brawl impressively features two N64 games. This very well could have been many players' first taste of different Nintendo franchises. For those curious about Pit from Subspace, they could try out the Kid Icarus demo. It's actually because of Pit's appearance in Brawl that I have a copy of Kid Icarus on NES. The real reason why Masterpieces was cut from Ultimate is probably because Switch doesn't feature a virtual console, after all, in addition to Masterpieces being a great way of giving players a taste of other Nintendo franchises, it also featured only games that could be purchased on Virtual Console, and in Smash 4 it had a link that would take the player straight to the purchase page if they so desired. So basically, since it could no longer act as a direct advertisement for purchasing games, they probably didn't think it was worth the trouble of including it in Ultimate. Thankfully, Ultimate brings back the Codec Calls from Brawl and Palatina's Guidance from Smash 4. Palatina's Guidance even added scenarios for all new characters in the base version of Ultimate, plus Piranha Plant. But unfortunately, there's no scenarios for Ultimate's other DLC characters. And although it is nice to see Snake's Codec Calls back, they're just the same scenarios from Brawl. No more, no less. Despite being Easter eggs, both these features bring a lot to the table in terms of character interaction and world building. It makes the game start to feel like an actual crossover. It's especially surprising to see these fan favorite scenarios still intact when you look at how other features in the game were cut down, more specifically, Final Smashes. While most Final Smashes were the same going from Brawl to Smash 4, Ultimate decides to cut down on the time Final Smashes take up across the board. If you weren't that into Final Smashes to begin with, then this is probably a change you would have liked since it gets you back to the main fighting faster. But for me personally, I like the more drawn out Final Smashes. They were probably the biggest gameplay change from Melee to Brawl that I was most excited about. When you think of Brawl, you think of the Smash Ball and Final Smashes. Even the more annoying Final Smashes like Super Sonic or Fox and Falco's Landmasters were hilarious during free for alls with friends. It could even be said that some of Ultimate's new Final Smashes take away a level of personality from certain characters. If we look at a comparison between Snake's Brawl and Ultimate Final Smashes, you can see what I'm getting at. I'm not a huge Metal Gear fan, but even so, Snake's Brawl Final Smash just seems to have much more personality. And as you can probably tell by now, personality is the main advantage Brawl has over Ultimate. I had such high hopes for Ultimate leading up to its release because World of Light looked like it would be this game's version of subspace, but better. 
In a Nintendo Direct about a month before Ultimate released, they showed us World of Light's opening cinematic. This thing was amazing. All our favorite characters teaming up against an armada of master hands, this time with voice acting. The whole sequence just screams personality. Fox McCloud at the front giving the orders makes a lot of sense for the leader of the Star Fox squad. Marth saying, we'll each need to take down about 10 is very fitting for the strategic warlord from Fire Emblem. Shulk seeing what's about to go down using his vision ability. I could go on and on, but it's best if you go watch that cinematic if you've somehow not seen it already, so you can appreciate all the small details that add the level of personalization which unfortunately is missing from the rest of the game. Yeah, the problem is that this is pretty much the only cinematic in the whole world of light. There's some others at the end of the game, but those are fairly generic and don't really feature our heroes. So boy, was I disappointed when I learned that the cinematic we saw back in the Nintendo Direct wasn't a teaser for what's to come, but it was literally the best part of World of Light. The stated reason why a subspace emissary type of story mode wasn't included in games after Brawl and will most likely never be included in any future Smash games is because Sakurai was salty that the cutscenes were uploaded to YouTube. That's a very old school Nintendo of Japan type of mindset and I hope we can all agree that it's dumb. Now it's possible that Sakurai won't work on the next Smash game, let's face it, there's going to be another Smash game eventually, but I think that Nintendo may have a new type of crossover series we can look forward to. Pure speculation, but if we aren't allowed real story modes in Smash games, maybe we can see our favorite Nintendo characters interacting with each other on the big screen. Yeah, I'm talking about the Mario movie. While we probably won't see characters like Link and Samus in this first film, we could be witnessing the start of a Nintendo cinematic universe. Finally, a worthy rival to the overabundance of superhero movies we've been flooded with for the past decade. Detective Pikachu and Sonic both did pretty well, so a true successor to the subspace emissary might still be on the table, just not in an actual video game. You know, this video was supposed to be about Brawl, but it's kind of becoming more than that. I'll wrap things up by bringing it back to my final reason why Brawl is still the best Smash game. And this might seem like cheating, but it's basically Project Plus, or Project M as it was formerly known. Remember that tier list at the start of the video? Well, Project Plus would probably be at the top of it if you consider it a true Smash game. It combines all the great stuff about Brawl, while also removing all the bad stuff about Brawl. You can drill shine Rayquaza and wave dash through all them subspace mazes. Where Brawl put the competitive smash scene in a dark era, Project M raised it from the ashes and is probably the start of the modern competitive smash scene we know today. Even though I'd consider myself a melee player first and foremost, it was actually because of Project M that I bothered to try out competitive smash at all. Even if you don't care about the competitive side of the game, you've probably at the very least tried Project M at some point. You know, with Wii's being so easy to mod and all that. Well, actually, you don't even need your Wii to be modded thanks to Brawl's stage builder exploit. Other than it being a drastically better competitive game, Project M adds new characters, stages, outfits, quality of life improvements. It's just a better game overall. Project M has always been that one Smash game which brings together the casuals, the melee diehards, and everyone in between. And it wouldn't have existed if Brawl wasn't so janky. So thank you, Brawl. Competitiveness aside, I've put more hours into Brawl than any other game in the series. It feels like the most complete Smash Bros. package. It has the greatest amount of single-player content, and even if I just want to have a fun items-on free-for-all with friends, Brawl is the pick. I hope we can all understand why Brawl was kicked to the curb so early on, and how that was really just a miscommunication. As Smash games start to become faster paced and further emphasize the competitive aspect, I feel that Brawl will always have a place in the Super Smash Bros. lineage, and definitely a place in my collection. Nothing.